All right, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Gabriel with Bay State Electric Works. We represent the Kohler branded generator. So we're here to do a training on the generator and its accessories, as well as the transfer switches and the motor initiator panel. Uh, so let's get started. One of the first things that we're gonna start with is the controller. The controller is known as a Decision Maker 550 or a DEC 550. Uh, it's got a couple of key components. First of all, is a key switch. Are we on test? No, we're fully fine. Okay, so I'm not gonna mess with that. <laughs> uh, key switch, you put it in auto. When you put it in auto, ideally you wanna have system ready. Um, right now we have a high fuel warning. So we lose the system ready, we get a warning here, but that's actually a good fault to have. So the fact that we have a fault on the screen, uh, we lose the system ready, but it's a good fault. But if you're wondering what it is, all you gotta do is come to reset menu, arrow down. The first uh, fault that we have is fuel level, high warning, analog channel four, fuel level, high warning, analog channel five. So there's a fuel gauge on the tank, just a needle from empty to full. It's got two wires coming out to the controller. Those two wires land on channel four and channel five, analog. That's why you have two faults. You go to you go further down, end of listing. So that's the only thing that we have is, as far as a fault. It's a good fault, trust me. Uh, but unfortunately, some people don't like that because the enunciator somewhere in the building somewhere will have a fault and they'll complain about it. So there are several things that can be done. We can pump fuel out or, or just tell them to live with it. It's a good fault. Okay, so the key switch is an auto. Uh, if there's gonna be maintenance done, like oil changes or battery replacement or something like that, you go to the off reset menu. That turns it off, it'll never start that way. I, sorry, I did have a question before we get too far from the fuel fault. Uh, the fuel fault, because it doesn't say system ready anymore now though, and it's in warning, it still will initiate and everything. It, like that fault correct, will correct. It, off, it correct? will still receive a, a remote run signal. It'll still work the way it's supposed to. Okay. It's just a, a fault because it's California a soft, like a soft fault. California standards, you cannot overfill a tank or else you have a hazmat spill. Sure. So we have to alarm you when you hit 90%, which is high fuel, and then alarm you when you hit 95%, which is critical high fuel. So because there are any faults, you, you, you lose the system ready, but it's still, you really do have a system. Okay. It's kind of one of those funky things that kind of clash with the programming, yeah. but you still have a generator. If there's a power outage right now, it will start, it will transfer. Okay, okay so off reset. So there's, so there's where you go to put it when you wanna do servicing, replace an air filter, replace fuel filters, replace oil, replace batteries, that sort of maintenance where you don't want to start up. Obviously when you're pumping oil, you don't want this engine to start up when it's dry. So, the, so you put it in the off reset. Once you're done and, you do, and you're finished with your maintenance, you can go to run. That's a manual run. So technically at the remote enunciator panel, and if there's monitoring, remote monitoring, there will be a fault coming in saying that we're not an auto because we're manually running it. We're not running it through an ATS or a power outage signal, okay? And that's through the fire alarm. And that would be through the fire alarm system. Okay. Next option that you see is a big red button. That's an emergency stop. Do we have a remote emergency stop somewhere in the perimeter? Okay, so we have only one stop, one e-stop. It's a local e-stop. That's a shutdown. Okay, shutdowns are a latching fault. So even though I'm gonna do it, breaker shunted. So even though we have a shutdown, and I have corrected it, we stay in shutdown. It's a latching fault. Every shutdown is latching. So you gotta correct the fault, go back to off reset, you hear the solenoid recycling, go back to auto, make sure you cycle that breaker. And if there's another fault present like high fuel, go ahead and silence it, okay? So, examples of shutdowns, emergency stop, overcrank, overcrank, it will crank three cycles and rest three cycles. It'll crank for 15 seconds, pause for 15 seconds, it'll do that three times. At the end of the last cycle, if it doesn't see a certain RPM reference, it'll go into an overcrank shutdown. Once again, latching fault. So, Conditions why an engine won't start, any engine, not just diesel. 
90% of my emergency calls are dead batteries or a bad battery charger or the breaker to the charger is off, okay? Next one, believe it or not, is fuel. You run out of fuel, like, like my wife does. Babe, hey, the truck won't start. I'm gonna take, take it to the mechanics. No, go get a fuel can <laughs> or I'll take care of it when I get home. You're just out of fuel, okay? Um, high temperature shutdown, low oil pressure shutdown, over speed shutdown, which will, you will probably never ever see in your lifetime anymore. Nowadays, the government, the, the governor for the engine speed is electronic. It's an ECM. 20, 30 years ago, they were mechanicals. And depending on the mechanical governor, it had a linkage to the, to the injection pump. And sometimes some people would smack it and over speed it and go shut down. Okay. And there's many, many other reasons. There's a big list of shutdowns that would cause it. On the AC side, low frequency, low voltage, high voltage. A lot of, there's a big list for shutdowns. But remember, a shutdown is latching. Once you correct it, you gotta go to off reset and then go to run to make sure that fault doesn't come back or put it in auto if you know that your shutdown was just e-stop, okay? We got a buzzer. The buzzer will alarm you when there's any fault present. A shutdown, a warning, high fuel warning. We got five lamps. First lamps programming mode. You can actually go into programming mode using the keypad or you could go to remote mode with using a laptop, which only we do, okay, for programming. You got not in auto, when you're not in auto. System ready, when there's no faults present. System warning, when there's a fault present. And then shut down, when there's shutdowns. It's pretty straightforward. You got a display giving you a text message and then you got keypads for navigation. A list of menus. Number 15 is not gonna be in here. If you punch in, if you punch in 15, it's not gonna come up, even though it's on the list. That's for paralleling generators. If you had two or more generators that parallel, then you would have menu 15. So let's go through menu one through 14. Menu one, generator monitoring. So what you could do is reset, one, enter, down there's where you get all your votes current frequency so right here you're gonna get line to line volts I'm assuming this is 480 so you expect to see 480 and then current if you're powering the building or a load bank next one down B to C A to C A to neutral you expect to see 277 there B to neutral, C to neutral, and then your frequency. Obviously, it's gotta be running for it to be producing volts and to see frequency and current. Okay, so you go back in there, there's an arrow to the right. If you arrow right, you're gonna get volts and amps summary. So there's gonna be all your voltage on all three phases, high, all three phases, low, which is phase to neutral, all current, all three phases, and then back to voltage summary or voltage amp summary, you arrow to the right, power kilowatts. That's a pretty nifty one because it gives you your total kilowatts and percentage of the nameplate rating. So if, you, if you're if you in a power outage and you happen to be out here and you're like, ah, I wonder what my load is right now in relation to what my limit is, it's labeled at a 350. I had a hard time seeing the nameplate because it's kind of behind. It's right about here on the alternator. So the best thing is to get your smartphone, get a picture of it and then look at it. I'm assuming it's right around 350. Okay, and I'll tell you right now how to get to that. So then it'll give you total kilowatts and percentage. So 50%, you expect to see about 175 kilowatts. And then, and then you're back at the beginning. KVAR, KVAR is cross current. Don't worry about that, you're not paralleling. KVAs. And then you're back at the beginning of that menu, okay? So that's just menu one. Menu two, here's another way to do it. Reset menu, arrow over to that menu, and then arrow down, okay? So menu two is engine monitoring. That's where you're gonna get your battery voltage. That's where you're gonna get your RPMs, water temperature, oil pressure, everything that's related to engine, okay? 
injection pressure or just it, it won't do injection pressure but it just will do simple. charged air pressure and temperature so there's a lot of things that that it will show you there's some things that it won't like injection pressure that's only for john deere yeah john deere will have to come out here plug their laptop into a, a diagnostic port and then they'll be able to screw with it okay so that's engines basic if you arrow to the right engine detail and then you arrow down you're going to get fuel coolant oil and the miscellaneous if you have a fault that's an ecm fault here's where you get your ecm fault codes like high charge air temperature there's one all right so that's menu two menu three is analog monitoring in menu three about the only thing you're gonna get here is battery voltage and fuel level. Remember it was channel four, channel five? So you go to four, 98%, five, 98%. And then that's pretty much it for, for that menu. Menu four is the next one. That is the most important menu that you wanna look at. That's because it has operational records. There's where you're gonna find your runtime. So you arrow down factory test date total runtime 16.5 hours we must have had a crazy spec for this generator to have 16.5 hours of runtime already loaded out of those 16.5 is 12.5 and unloaded is four so why do i say that's your most important menu well there's this wonderful entity called scaqmd they govern how many hours per year you're allowed to run a generator. And out of that bulk of time that you're allowed to run, a very, very little fraction of that is allowed for maintenance and testing. So keep an eye on your hours, keep a good log. If there's a power outage, you need to log it down. If there's a manual run, you gotta log it down. You don't want those to be on the bad side of AQMD. AQMD is a, is a government entity. They can cite you. They will find you. And it's not cheap. Okay? So that's menu four. Menu five is event history. If there's an event and somebody accidentally cleared it and doesn't remember what the event was, go to, go to event history. So the last thing I did was go to off reset. So master not in auto. Master not in auto, emergency stop. So your most recent is at the top of the list and your oldest is at the bottom of the list. I believe it holds a hundred events. That's plenty enough for someone to come back here and say, what was my history from two days ago? Okay. Next one is gonna be time and date. It's basically just that, time and date. You scroll down, Tuesday, October 29, 2019, 10.03 a.m. Is that right? Anybody got a cell phone, is that right? Yep. Okay. That's just it, time and date. It's a little off. It's a little off. How far off is it? 13, 16, 13, right 13, 13 minutes. Okay, well, menu 14 is programming mode. So let's do this. Let's go to programming mode, which is menu 14. Enter, arrow down. The first window that pops up or the first text that pops up tells you the condition we're in now. We're in the off programming mode. We arrow to the right to local. We say yes, enter. Super secret password, can somebody guess? It's only one digit. One, 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 one. one. It's only one digit. <laughs> Zero. Zero, enter. Enter accepted. We now have a flashing programming mode lamp. Flashing means it's local. We go back to menu six, time and date. So we go to where time is. Once again, what was the time? 10 what? 10, 16, maybe 10, so, 17. So you now. punch in 10, 10 1, 7. 7. If it's AM or PM, you use the AM, PM button, which is right here. It's AM already. We hit enter. Entry accepted. It's pretty, pretty easy. Okay. Once you do that, do not leave it in programming mode because the wrong person will start punching buttons and change things around. So we go back to menu 14, programming mode. Once again, the state we're in right now is local programming. We arrow to the right to the off. We tell it yes, enter. Super secret code is? Zero. Zero, enter. We are no longer in programming mode. That lamp stops flashing. Okay, 
Next one, generator system. Seven, enter, arrow down. Standby, line to line 480, frequency is 60 hertz, three phase Y, kilowatt rating is 360, gentlemen. It's not a 350, like our sticker says. It's a 360. So that's like a Big Mac combo. You go to McDonald's, you order a Big Mac combo. But do you want a super size? Yes. You want ketchup? That's a little different, right? So now it's actually 360. All right. We arrow down again. Rated currents, 541 amps. 541 amps is for your inrush, for motor starting, starting, sorry. It's not 541 continuous. If it peaks above 541, when, it, when all your equipment starts up, it's going to go into alternator protection shutdown. That means you got to overload it. RPM, 1800. And then your load shed output, once it hits 360, there's a relay that can be tied to your equipment for load shedding. You would tie your least important equipment to that and say, let's load shed this particular one because we're already at 100% load. And then other parameters like over voltage. If, if it ever hits 552 volts, which is 115% of 480, then it'll shut down over that. Your under voltage is 408 volts. Your over frequency is 84 hertz. That's 140%. Your under frequency is 54 hertz, which is 90%. Over speed, that's uh, 70 hertz. Bless you. Thank you. Battery voltage, 24 volts DC. There are two lead acid batteries for 24 volts. Your low battery voltage comes in at 24 volts or less. High battery voltage comes in at, two, at 32 volts or higher. Uh, your RPM is 1860 hertz, so on and so forth. All, all how it was programmed from the factory. Okay, so that would be, that would be generator system menu seven. Menu eight, time delays is our next menu. Engine start, zero seconds. So as soon as the ATS gives us a contact closure, this does not wait any longer. It begins to crank immediately. There is no starting eight. There's, there's no post starting eight. It just relies on the block heater. The block heater should keep that engine warm enough to fire off and be online in 10 seconds or less. It's actually around six seconds. These John Deere's are pretty quick block heater always on or that block heater should always be energized but it has a thermostat that cycles it off and on so there will be times you come in you grab that hose it's going to be somewhat warmer than ambient temperature but it should be on at 80 degrees or below off at 100 degrees so theoretically this engine will always be somewhere between 80 and 100 degrees preheated ready to accept the load okay so let's get out of this Next one is gonna be input setup. That's for me. <clears throat> Inputs like uh, like generator door intrusion. We could do an input for that. Input for low fuel level, tank leak, that sort of stuff, okay? That's for me to set up during commissioning. You guys don't have to worry about that menu. Menu 10, output. There's a, there's a, a circuit board behind this cover that's with uh, con dry contact relays, form C. And that's how it's communicating with the fire alarm panel. Most likely it's gonna be something like low fuel level. By the way, low fuel level comes in at approximately 50%. Not like our cars where you have just 10 miles to go and you better find a fuel station. 50% of whatever this tank is, is low fuel. So if you get low fuel, don't panic. Come out here, confirm that what your fuel level is at and then order a tanker to come out or call us, whatever. And we confirm by the gauge that's, you know, the gauge is back there, right? There's a gauge right behind, right about here on the tank. Yeah. There's one here. The there's another separate gauge out there. That's just a reference gauge for the tanker. The actual gauge that communicates here is the one that's in here. Okay, so that's going to be our, our output setup. So once again, uh, so outputs to the fire alarm enunciator panel is most likely something around low fuel, generator running, generator trouble, tank leak. Might be something extra, I'm not sure. I wasn't the technical decommissioning, but those, usually those four are what they require, okay? Voltage regulator, that's for me, for adjustment. 
calibration. That's just calibration of the metering. I put my fluke meter on the breaker. I fire it off. Whatever my fluke meter says is what I calibrated to. Communications, that should be already set up. Communications with uh, your remote enunciator panels, what that's about. Programming mode, you guys just saw how to do programming mode for clock and time and date adjustment. That's the only reason you need, ever need to access the programming mode. If you're uncomfortable, give me a call. I'll guide you through it. If you're still uncomfortable, don't worry about it. We live in California. We know that in fall, we go back one hour. We know that in spring, we go up one hour. And hopefully that might change in the next couple of years. But if, if you don't feel comfortable with changing time and date, then don't worry about it. We all have acclimated. We all know that in the fall, it changes and then spring it changes. And then the last one is menu 15, which you do not have here. Okay? Keypad navigation. Your number seven is also a yes command. Your number eight is a no command. Uh, your number zero is a lamp test button. That one there's your alarm off and AM PM if you want to do your time adjustments. You can do a program run if you want to. And then, and then when you're done with it, without having to touch this at all, you can do a program run and then you can stop the program run. Reset menu to wake it up. The lights turn on, the screen comes to lit. And then navigation arrows. Arrow right, arrow down, enter that menu to a sub menu. Once again, you got my business card, give me a call, I'll guide you through it. If I don't answer, I'm probably at a loud generator, followed up with a text. This is so-and-so, Kyle Pauly Pomona, you did the training a couple of months ago. Remind me who I'm calling, because nowadays with robocalling, I don't answer my phone, guys. I, I hardly ever write. Unless it's Rosadin and I got his name recorded as Jim from Rosadin Electric, that's the only time I'm gonna answer. Chances are, if you guys call me, chances are I won't, I won't answer. Followed up with a text. I'm, I'm not that 16 year old teenager at home. Text, text, text. I have to be. I text with, with my technicians. I text with my bosses. It's a lot easier for a text and a phone call because sometimes I'm load banking. Actually, a lot of times I'm load banking. Any questions here? Make sure you're in auto. Make sure that if you have a fault, it's a good fault. Make sure your main breaker is on. That breaker is your main breaker, which I'm assuming is going to a distribution panel, which then feeds five other breakers, possibly a fire pump. Right there. This is your load bank breaker. That should always be off. This is for the load bank up there at the end of the enclosure. And that one there apparently is a spare. It's a 60 amp spare. I don't know. <laughs> okay, up in here is our diagnostic port for John Deere. You cannot touch it, I cannot touch it. Well, you can touch it, but it's not gonna do anything. Poke type of deal, right? But it, you can't play with it. It's got a toggle switch to turn the ECM on, so when the John Deere is here and they plug it in, they actually energize the ECM and they can talk to the ECM. And John Deere doesn't call it ECM, they call it ECU. So yeah, ECU. Okay, let's move on to what's behind me. Simplex. This is the controller to the load bank. And this is the breaker to it. So you gotta run the generator, make sure this breaker is on. And if you're gonna put a load on it, make sure the main breaker is off because you don't wanna put a load on that and then you got your earmuffs on. You don't know if there's a power outage going to happen any minute now. And then you accidentally overload with building load and load bank. So if you if you want to do a load bank, turn that breaker on, turn this break or off, turn this breaker on, manually run it. At that point, the display turns on. You follow the steps. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple logic on the on the controller. I'm not going to run it, guys. It's going to be a lot of noise. I won't be able to talk. But when you run it, you'll see it turn on. You'll see the easy commands. Enter, go, apply load, that sort of stuff. It's pretty straightforward, okay? We got this thing called Soot Alerts. Soot Alert is made by Johnson Matthew. That big black box is made by Johnson Matthew. So the fact that we've got a care center here for, my, for minors, children, we have to filter out the exhaust. And it is a almost a standard now for almost every generator because everywhere you go, there's 
care centers. Everywhere you go, there's elementary schools. So about 80% of the commissioning that I've been doing in the last seven, eight years, they've had a particulate matter filter. So if you didn't have that and you had a regular muffler and you're gonna run this guy, you're gonna see a bag, a big black plume of smoke. Now, why do we see a big black plume of smoke? Because we have to be ready to accept the load in 10 seconds or less. How do you get an engine from zero RPM to 1800 RPM and ready to accept the load within 10 seconds? Throttle it. Like your car in your driveway, you turn it on. If you wanna see what it takes to go from zero RPM to 18, you gotta turn the ignition on and you gotta step in a throttle, right? Well, what happens with a diesel engine when you throttle it? A lot of smoke, a lot of black smoke, particulate matter. We gotta track that. So in that box, there's either one or two or three assemblies that look like cylinders with a clamp in between. The first one is the catalyst. The second one is, for a better way of explaining it, a honeycomb ceramic filter. It's got all these million holes that are ceramic that allow the gas to flow through but it traps the ash. We don't produce ash, we produce soot. So the soot hits the catalyst, it sticks to the catalyst, and in time, it'll plug up the catalyst. In order for that catalyst to catalyze and turn that soot into ash, you have to put a high exhaust temperature in there. How do you put a high exhaust temperature in there? A high electrical load. Just like your little Honda going up El Cajon Pass. If you're by yourself, you're flying at 85, 90. You got five people in there, you gotta step on it and your engine heats up and your exhaust heats up. So if this guy begins to alarm you that you've got back pressure issues and you gotta put a load bank on there, you gotta put a proper load. Typically 700 degrees or higher is what will allow that catalytic converter to catalyze. It'll then burn that soot into ash the ash flows through it, gets caught in the filters. Filters are exactly what they are called. They are filters. What do filters do? Trap things, but eventually they get clogged. There are companies out there that will remove your filter, bake it on site, or put it into a vacuum on site and clean that filter out. Sometimes if you wait too long, that doesn't work and you have to throw those away and buy brand new ones which are about $10,000. So keep an eye on that back pressure. Make sure you apply your load as frequently as you are allowed to. Remember AQMD governs how much time you're allowed to run it. So you, someone's gonna get together and come up with a game plan on how you're gonna prevent your exhaust from backing up. You have to have that exhaust because of that. It's not a bad thing, guys. It's actually a good thing. We've got nice clear skies right now. If you were in Santa Monica like I was yesterday, you didn't have nice clear skies. I had ash falling all over me, okay? But there's a reason why California is crazy and clean air and all that stuff, okay? It's, it's, it's a new norm. Yes, sir. So to tell you how much is high back pressure, does it just tell you what it's high back pressure or does it give you a value and if it's, if it, what the value is, what would be considered high back pressure? In your manuals that came with the generator, there's gonna be a sheet. The sheet will tell you the maximum back pressure for this engine. It's gonna be in mercury. You gotta go online and convert it from mercury to inches of water column, because this guy's looking at inches of water column. When you cycle your breakers, turn it on manually, you go to menu one, which is temperature and pressure, menu one. And there's gonna tell you what your pressure is and what your temperature is. At that point, once you put it to that menu, you begin to apply a load. If you try to, if you apply your load and you tell it to do, there is another menu, I believe is menu three, and you tell it that you're gonna do a filter cleaning, it's gonna look, it's got a um, algorithm it wants to see pressure from the generator because it's running, so you're, you're creating exhaust pressure. The pressure comes in through this copper line and it wants to see temperature from this thermocouple. So up there, you see the thermocouple going in and you see the copper line going in. 
That's the only thing between here and there. So it looks at pressure and temperature. If your temperature is below 700 degrees and you tell it to, to, to do a, that you're doing a regen, it's not gonna allow you. It's gonna say exhaust too cold or too cold or something like that. You have to be 700 degrees or higher for it to start the algorithm, okay? Unfortunately, you have a lot of accessories with this generator. And unfortunately, you have to do a lot of homework. There's so much I can talk about this and I can talk to I'm blue in the face, but not until you read it, you will you understand how this system works, okay? But there, there are a couple of menus you wanna look at. Menu one, menu two, menu three on this guy, okay? And then if you wanna get out of the menu, you hit escape. So menu one is to, uh, pressure and temperature at this moment. If it's running, you'll have higher temperature and higher pressure. Escape out of there. Menu two is where you choose, is where you see where it's programmed to. High pressure comes in at 27 inches of water column, okay? High temperature comes in at 1250. And then menu three is gonna be, not there. And then here menu three is where you tell it that, you, that you're cleaning your filters. Do some homework, gentlemen. You need to, you're gonna need to know this eventually. <coughs> this manufacturer, Johnson Matthew, states that you get 24 cold starts. After 24 cold starts, there'll be enough soot in that catalyst to create a back pressure issue. We have had, we have had 37 starts. Now, I don't know when we put a load bank on this, if we put it on a 36th start, or if we put it on a 30th start, because I wasn't here to do the commissioning. But this tells you how many starts it's had. Okay. Not trying to scare you guys, but you need to you need to do some homework and understand this and prevent this. It'll it'll come up. It'll sneak up behind you if you, if you don't pay attention to it. And then you're calling me. And then I'm gonna say load bank it. Okay. Any questions on the monitors and the controllers? Okay. Let's move on to the next. Oh, we do have a remote stop. Right. So if you've got an e-stop, make sure you check both of these. This one here is rotate to reset, where this one here is pull to reset, okay? Oh. Nameplate for the generator and accessories from the factory are on the alternator. There's a total of four labels. Those, they're silver with black print. They're, they're kind of hard to see from this angle. Even if this was not in my way, they're kind of hard to see. Get a smartphone, get a picture of them, okay? Okay, let's go to this side. So behind this e-stop, you got two fuel filters. One's a spin-on filter, and then the other one is also a spin-on, but it has a bowl underneath it. That bowl is a water separator type, and the bowl will let you see if you've got water in your tank. It'll separate it, and it'll keep it there. It'll look like vinegar and oil. It'll, it'll actually be separate. It's also got a drain port where you can drain it. It also has a sensor that gives you an alarm that you got water in the fuel, okay? They're both spin-on filters. Right here, we got an oil filter. It's also a spin-on. It takes about a gallon of oil. This is not this is not Jiffy Loop, gentlemen. We're talking about gallons, not quarts. This is a big engine. In between those filters, you're gonna get an oil fill cap. It doesn't say oil, nor does it say 710. Just gives you a little oil icon. Above the oil fill cap is your dipstick. It's got a yellow handle. It's got a minimum and a maximum setting. What did our fathers teach us when we first started driving? Never overfill. Never overfill, but also <laughs> check our oil. So right now, this is our add. This is our full. We're in between. We're in range. Never add more than that. Never go above that. 
Some people will tell you that you'll begin to blow seals. Some people will say other things. I don't think you'll blow seals because the only way you blow a seal is if you actually increase your oil pressure. If you happen to, let's say the oil pump was accessible and you pulled it out and put a high volume oil pressure. Well, at that point, when you increase your pressure and you possibly will blow a seal. But there's another thing that happens when you overfill it. Um, you'll actually make the oil frothy and then the oil pump will pick up that frothy oil, no longer solid oil. And then that's how you lose bearings because you don't have solid oil. There's windage trays. There's all this wonderful stuff to prevent that sort of stuff. But human error is always human error. Okay. What's that? I said you fill it past the windage tray. Yeah. And then yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. So just don't overfill. If you want to overfill, just a teeny tiny tick above full. <laughs> or practice not overfilling. If you happen to pull that dipstick and it looks like coffee and cream, panic. <laughs> Make a meal and phone calls because that means you got water in the oil and you should not run that engine. E stop it. Make phone calls. Do not run that engine if you see that there's water in the oil. It could be something simple like a freeze plug in the head, it could be something really bad, okay? like cylinders or sleeves and their seals are no longer sealing the water out of the oil. It could be many things. So okay? checking this oil, the best to check it after it's ran a little bit or just from cold? Always before. Always. If you happen to do a long-term run, like 12 hours, because it was a long power outage, the hills were on fire. Who's down here, water and power? Edison? Edison. Edison. Whoever, whoever them douchebags are. <laughs> Whoever's down here, they decide to kill the power because we got fires and your generator runs for a long time, like 12 hours. And then your power comes back and it shuts down and everything's cool. Check your oil. Every engine burns oil, gentlemen. No matter how new, no matter if it's an old Chevy or a brand new Honda, every engine burns oil. Okay? When it's brand new, you hardly won't see the burn. When it's 15 years old, you'll be adding a quart every month. Okay, you see this hose? This hose connects to the block heater. The block heater hovers under the oil pan and it comes out the other side. Coolant comes in through here, somewhat warm, sometimes cool. It exits the block heater on that side, nice and warm, okay? You got a ball valve on this side, you got a ball valve on the other side. If you start seeing that there's leakage from the block heater assembly itself or from one of these hoses, don't wait till your radiator dumps all its coolant out. De-energize that block heater, close these valves, make some phone calls. These valves allow you to replace a block heater and its hoses without losing all the coolant in your radiator. Okay? Eight gallons of coolant, about eight. That's not bad. Well, <laughs> when, when coolant costs about $15 a gallon. Still not bad. <laughs> okay, up in here you cannot see it, but yes, there is a radiator cap. You just follow the upper radiator hose and it's right next to it, which means that gentlemen like me or bigger have a hard time getting in there. Find a little squirrely guy to squirrel in there and check the radiator. He's looking at you. <laughs> he might squeeze in there. <laughs> yeah, they make John Deere's, they're, they're, they're tough to get in there, okay? It's, it's just what it is. Usually the exhaust comes up and out, and usually the muffler is in this chamber, but because we got a particular matter filter, because we have a child care center, it was modified and now your exhaust goes up. So now you can't put your torso in there. I have once in a while crawled in the back, crawled above the engine to get to the cap. Yes, it sucks for me too, guys, not just for you. <laughs> Up there, next to the radiator hose, to the left of it, you can't see it from here, but there's a sensor. The sensor is a low coolant level sensor. If your coolant level drops below that sensor, it's a shutdown. It's a 30 second shutdown. Engine will start, 10 seconds later, uh, it's time delay expires, and then it starts a 20 second inhibit. No, I'm sorry, 20 second, 10 second inhibit, and then 20 second delay. If within those 30 seconds, the coolant level doesn't rise, shuts down. Remember what's a shutdown, it's latching. It'll tell you low coolant level sender or, or low coolant level. So what do you do? Pull your dipstick first. 
Make sure there's no water in the oil. If the oil's good, put the dipstick back, get up there and add coolant. Once you add coolant, look for the leak. There was one time that I went to a certain college. I will not say which college it was. And they were having random low coolant level shutdowns. They thought it was a bad controller because they never saw a puddle down here. I got a ladder. I went all the way up there. At the very top of the radiator hose was a little pinhole and it would leak two or three drops a day. But because it was only two or three drops a day, there was a little crater, kind of like a, what's, a, what's that? What's that where they have the geysers, that park? And it was a little crust, a little crust of colorful antifreeze, greenish, bluish color. It only did a couple of drops, so it would dry up there. It would never drip down. Once I went up there, I, I came right back down. I'm like, ah, you guys are crazy. <laughs> you guys need a ladder. <laughs> so it could be something as simple as that, guys. Look for coolant crusting. If it's so residual, you'll see it crusting around the fittings, okay? It'll never puddle up. At that point, add coolant. If it's in the power outage and you got to get it going, add coolant. But once the power outage expires and you're back in standby mode, Address it, okay? There's no coolant makeup reservoir or anything? Like a reservoir that... Yeah. No, sir. No, sir. Radiator. Radiator upper tank. The upper tank takes about five gallons. That's technically the reservoir. Okay, right back here, just, just to the left of this lower radiator hose is a um, spigot. That's where you drain your coolant if you ever have to drain the coolant, okay? If you drain the coolant, what do you do first? You de-energize the block heater. Block heaters don't like to be energized when they're dry, okay? De-energize the block heater, drain the coolant, repair whatever hose you're gonna repair, replace whatever thermostat. I'm sure you're not gonna get that deep into it, but let's just say you do. Replace the thermostats, whatever. Once you reassemble, top it off, give it a, give it a 30 minute run to burp out all the bubbles, and then you energize the block heater. Block heaters are very finicky. If you introduce air into it, it's gonna burn that element up so fast, really fast. Pretty simple to de-energize the block heater? Or? There is a panel on the other side that has breakers for the battery charger, okay. the block heater, uh, AC lighting, and uh, I think service receptacles, right? Something like that. Okay. We'll, I'll point it out on that side. Okay, any questions on the engine on this side? Exhaust is very hot. Okay, the turbo is right here. Big old snail. Very hot. There's a little sticker right there that says, do not touch, very hot. But it's tiny, people ignore it. <laughs> Just know that his exhaust will be hot, okay guys? Uh, once again, the fuel gauge is right behind here on top of the fuel tank. That's the one that communicates with the controller. Okay, let's go to the front. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Underneath the engine oil pan is a nameplate for the tank. The tank is 774 gallons, okay? Let's move our way this way. Looks like a pigeon had a yep. bad encounter with a hawk there. Okay, gentlemen, on this side is gonna be a fuel gauge, which is reference for the tanker that comes in. This is a five gallon spill containment box. And in here is your fuel fill. Pretty straightforward. Any questions about this? Please do not put a water hose in there. Why does Gabe say that? Because it's that. So does the fuel get old so bad? If fuel, used, fuel, this used. gentleman's got a lot of good questions. Fuel nowadays, because we're in California, is ultra low sulfur. And because it's ultra low sulfur, it does not have the same shelf life as it did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you could have diesel for four years and it still had the same hit. It didn't spoil. Fuel does now. People out there offer fuel polishing and then they put additives. But because you have a catalyst, those additives will poison your catalyst, poison. 
So about the only thing you could do is call a fuel company if it's bad fuel, ask them to pump it out to buy it off of you, or you pay them, <coughs> you pay them to to pump out your dirty fuel and top it off with fresh fuel, or you could do what we call fuel polishing. We put a pump in there, we suck it out from here, we dump it out at another end, and we let it run for three, four, or five hours until that fuel comes out clean and we remove all the sediments and whatever water may be in there, if there's water. But that's not that's not a 100% good answer, okay? That's just a Band-Aid. The best thing to do is to have fresh diesel. And please do not use biodiesel. Biodiesel expires much faster. And how do you know when to feel bad? Is there a time, amount of time? Or? Fuel sampling to a lab. You gotta send up your own lab. Fuel sampling to a lab. Guys, excuse me for a second. I gotta get my PPE. <laughs> uh, we gotta start over again. Yeah. <laughs> gentlemen game quick somebody else came in <laughs> completely different person okay this is a tank monitor kit it tells you when you're at 90 percent full this flex goes in for battery voltage this flex here there's a float in here once that float comes up at 90 percent you get a buzzer and a light and the option to silence it okay so here we have bench this is, this is a normal vent. It's got an open cap. This is your emergency vent. It's got a pressurized cap. And this is your emergency vent for the secondary tank, pressurized cap as well. Okay. What we have here is a tank within a tank, double wall tank. If your primary tank leaks into the secondary tank, there's an alarm way back over there, another float that looks for that. Once that float comes up, you get a message saying tank leak, rupture basin, sorry. Okay, so there's a vent on the secondary tank because if there is a leak and there happens to be a fire before the tank gets replaced, you gotta be able to vent that tank, okay? And if the fires are around the tank and that tank begins to bulge out, it needs to vent out faster than this pipe allows it to. So that's why you have a, a vent here and a vent here, okay? Please do not let anybody, if there happens to be a lock on there, do not let anybody think it's okay to pop this open and put a nozzle in there. That's the wrong way of filling. That's, that's a quick way of getting, getting into trouble. Okay, because they think that's, that's part of the primary tank and it's not. This is a secondary tank. Okay, this, tank, this area should always be dry. Always. Okay, let's walk around this way. All right, so this is uh, the front half of the engine. Here's the block heater hose that I was telling about. This is gonna be the warmer side of the block heater where the block heater has either one element or two elements that heats the coolant. Once that, or antifreeze, once that antifreeze gets hot, it naturally wants to rise up this hose. So this hose is the output side of the block heater. This hose will be warmer than the input side hose. This hose also has a ball valve at the back of the engines where it dumps in, okay? Here's two lead acid batteries behind this panel. They're group 31s, they're lead acid. They are sealed, so you can't just remove caps and, and check the water level, okay? Batteries and air filters are the one thing you guys need to swap out every three years, okay? Air filters are a paper element type of filter they have multiple pleats and they may look dirty on the outside, but they're actually, they may actually flow enough, but every three years replace them because since they are a paper element, they will degrade. They're, they are prone to dry air. They're prone to humid air. They're prone to fog. 
So they will begin to degrade with these changes of the weather. I, I've, I've gone to units where there's chunks of filter missing, which means that engine has been sucking unfiltered air and makes you wonder where that chunk of the filter went to. We went through the turbo, out the exhaust, I don't know. <laughs> don't get in that position to where you might be doubting your system because you got a chunk of air filter missing, okay? Air filters and batteries every three years, gentlemen. Even though they test okay, they're not trusted. You know, we, we're, once again, we're in a time where everything's recycled. Lead for batteries is recycled now. There, there's no mining for virgin lead. Well, there might be, but not for batteries. Batteries are all recycled now. So three years. The air filter somewhere up here. <laughs> the air filter somewhere up here. We're gonna get to it. We're gonna get to it next. All right, let's come over this side. So the air filter is right here. It's a Donaldson air filter. And it's probably two filters within one where it's got an inner cylinder and then an outer filter. Okay? This is the one I'm talking about. Three years, no, no later than that. To the left of it on this side is a filter that takes that oil burning and that excessive crankcase pressure, crankcase pressure, and it puts it through an element. That element will then allow the oil vapor to become a solid again, it'll drip back into the engine. Whatever it cannot trap will then get fed into the intake and burnt off. There are times there are older generators that don't have this filter in place. They just have a hose from the upper valve cover to the tank and it'll put an oil on there. That's actually a normal thing, okay? But because this is all California now and it's all new. They're, they're putting filters on that crankcase. It's, it's called a crankcase breather is what it's called. Raycord makes out. Raycord, yep. Okay, here's that panel. Sub panel, sorry. So we got the main breaker for the sub panel. We got outlets, lights, battery charger, and block heater, okay? Battery charger, 10 amps, 24 volts, very compact. Gone are the days where you have a humongous charger with a humongous transformer and two gauges, one for voltage, one for current. And gone are the days where those chargers are this big. They're now like this. They got a cord for AC power. They got a cord for battery voltage output. And they got a cord that has CAN communication to the controller. Very compact, very, very handy because they're so small. You can put them anywhere now, okay? It's got a series of lights. Your power and your communication should always be on, but depending what these lights here tell you, here's a list, it'll tell you what rate that charger is in at that time, whether it's bulk rate, whether it's equalized, whether it's float. It all depends on what these lights tell you, okay? And there's a chart right here. It's really tiny. It's not that small. You can read it, but... Earlier, the red one was on. Red solid. By itself? No, with the greens on. Were they both solid, or was one of them blinking? The one was just solid. So red solid, green solid. Yeah. So, uh, steady red and green, absorption mode. Any questions on the chart? Air filter, panel, batteries. Okay, if you're gonna remove a battery, what do you do first? You put the generator into the off position. You either turn off the breaker or unplug the charger, one or the other, whatever you're comfortable with. You then remove the ground and then the jumper and then your positive. Pull them batteries out. Good luck not hurting your shoulders because I don't see an easy way of getting them batteries out of there. Probably that way. Once you put the new batteries in, and get them bolted down with a hold down bracket. What bat What cable do you land first? Positive. positive. And the battery charger positive output. And that panel out there, it's positive. They all land in the same spot. You tighten that down. You put your jumper, 
you put your negative along with this negative and that other, that other one negative, you tighten it down. At that point, if your wrench hits chassis ground, you're not gonna arc. If you do it the other way, if you start with positive, your wrench hits chassis ground or this receptacle or anything else that's metal, it's gonna arc. 24 volts. You're gonna weld that, you're gonna weld that wrench. If you're quick enough, you'll just weld a little bit off of it. If you're not quick, it's, it's gonna weld, okay? Why do we have the alarm? Do we hear the alarm? That's because this is off and it lost communication. So right now, if you go over there, is is better charger calm loss, battery charger fault, because I unplugged it. And because we have a high fuel, it's not gonna go away until I go over, because we do re-trigger the alarm. So because it's high fuel, it's gonna stay on until I go over there and silence it. Okay, nothing over here. You can open it if you want to, but please don't lick the bus bar when it's running. Any questions, gentlemen? Any questions on, on anything that I talked about? Fuel tank, load bank, particular matter filter. If you do, you got my business card. Give me a call, follow it up with a text. Remind me who you are, where you're at, and I will call you back. Okay? Let's see if there's any surprises on this side. Once a year. Once a year. Once a year is, is, is a good standard. And then the laboratory that we use actually keeps a history. You know, they keep a history of by serial number and job site name. And then they'll keep a history of oil and fuel and coolant. So we got three here. Yes, 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 yes. So we got six oil, ITSs total. Oil change on it once a year. Uh, they go by by hours, hours, every hundred hours or once a year. Okay. All right. So generator breaker feeds these panels. These panels will then feed your ATSs. Okay. There's a power outage. Generator's running. Some of the building's not on. That should be on. Look at these breakers. Sometimes they will trip downstream. Sometimes they won't, depending on how bad the spike is when a transfer happened. There's a lot of electrical terms that I'm not gonna get into, but let's imagine two clocks, okay? Utility is always 60 Hertz. Their voltage may fluctuate, but they're always 60 Hertz. So let's imagine utilities A phase, if it's a clock, 180 degrees, let's say utility is always at 12 o'clock, they're A phase. Generator is not always running and not always matching utility. Generator is stopped. When it turns on, its A phase might be at six o'clock. That's a 180 degree angle to transfer on. That is the biggest spike you can have. If generator is at three o'clock or nine o'clock, that's a 45 degree angle. That's less of a spike. Okay, so depending on how things are set up and what the specs call for, it might transfer at 180 degrees off and it might create a spike it might trip a breaker here or a breaker downstream after the ats so there's times where you might have something going wrong it's not always a generator okay breakers are here we got six six breakers six ats's yes yeah. okay all, all three buildings are in each one of the panels right is it a b and the D right there, yeah. is that how they're labeled? Yeah. The one's for what's that lighting over there, and then... Yes, those are the lighting and these are the... Uh, yeah, uh, like the elevators, yeah. Transform. Okay, gents, let's go to the ATSs. Never, never. <coughs> <coughs> Wipe out the filters in here. Clean them periodically. But, uh, yeah. Or is that for construction? Uh, that's a good question. I guess everyone's going to put a little air on. If you're going to put air on, make sure the generator's not running and not energized. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, they, they can be taken out of the box. It's just a. Uh, 
Yeah, horse hair, like yeah. hog's hair. Or yeah, they yeah, yeah, they also do plastic. Okay, uh, I don't know where the electric bike is, guys. Do you guys know where it is? Do we follow Jim? Sure. Yeah. Come on. Okay, gentlemen, this is one of the many ATSs. Uh, ATS trans stands for automatic transfer switch. Um, in the most generic form of an automatic transfer switch is, or the most generic definition, is that it is an under voltage detector. If you disable all of the other, all of the other features, that's what it is. It's an under voltage detector. Okay, that means that when your voltage on the commercial side drops below a certain threshold, this ATS will then send a signal to the generator due to a contact closure, and the generator will start up once it's time that it's expired, which are zero seconds, okay? But it also has many other features enabled, over voltage, over frequency, under frequency. So if commercial power is too high, or its frequency is too high, it'll go to the generator. It wants to see a good solid 480 at 60 hertz. Okay, the only reason I will ever ask you guys to open up this door is for the nameplate. We all have the nameplates in that same area, just behind the controller. There is a harness here that is attached to every single phase, so you don't know which wire is 480 and which wire is a dry contact. So I would never ask you guys to try to do some troubleshooting with an energized ATS or with a problematic ATS. The only time I'm gonna ask you to open up an ATS is to get me the model number, serial number, spec number, shoot me a picture, something like that, okay? So I know what I'm looking at. Believe it or not, there is 480 on these wires. Transformer, sip it down to control voltage for metering and for controls. Okay, we get a contactor. This particular contactor is four poles, all three phases and the neutral. So we're switching neutral. Here's the remote start terminals on this side. And if you notice, there is a handle. Why is there a handle? If I'm told, if I'm telling you that I would never let you go in here, okay? Because should this logic fail and you're in a power outage, should the coil burn up and you're in a power outage, or should the bridge rectifier burn up and you're in a power outage and you have to have power because there's a, there's a professor somewhere threatening to sue because of their laboratory experiments that are gonna fail, you do have the ability to change the position of this contactor. Right now, kind of hard to see, but there's an end stamped on here. That means we're connected to normal power. Okay, we put this in here and cycle it. First of all, the logic's gonna fight me. Second of all, I'm gonna create a lot of arcing because it's energized, right? But should I be able to do it, you'll see an E there telling you that you're connected to the generator. Okay, why am I showing you this? Because not everything's perfect. If you have to come in here and transfer manually, if you're trained, if you get paid enough, and if you're brave enough, okay? That alone should put the fear of God in all you guys right now. In other words, don't get in here. Call us, call the electrician that knows an ATS. They would then turn off the breaker to this ATS from the generator. Not necessarily the whole generator, because it's just this one that's failed. Go to the breaker that we were just at, this one, turn off its breaker, so generator power is not here. Go to the utility breaker, which is, I'm assuming is in this room, find its breaker, turn it off, so now you have completely isolated it's dead. With your meter, check that everything is completely dead, then change it from normal to generator, close the door, go back and turn those breakers on. It is now a manual transfer switch instead of an automatic because either the logic failed 
or the coil has failed or the bridge rectifier has failed. You're able to transfer it anyway. But once again, if you're trained, can you hold up the handle? Just so the camera can get it. Do you see in the camera where it goes into, in the wheel? Okay. At this point, I would pull it up and I would make sure that it's solid because it's got an inertia wheel that if that coil gets hit, hit with 480 volts. Now, a coil that gets hit with 480 volts, it's gonna hit, a, it's gonna be a hard hit. It's gonna transfer that mechanism like that. A human arm cannot move that fast, which is the reason why you have to kill power to it. If I try to do that right now, if I disconnect the logic so it won't fight me and try to move it, I'm gonna arc too much. I cannot move fast enough to prevent arcing. Not only that, that puts me in a bad position. I have to have a suit and, and mask and gloves, okay? That's why it's better to kill power to it. You're, it's already been dead for a while. By the time you got the call and you got told, hey, there's no power, but there should be, by that time, everything's already dead. Fridge is already off, everything's dead. Okay, so don't panic. Get a meter, confirm everything's dead. Open breakers if you have to. Make sure you're solidly connected to generator. Close it, and then re-energize the breakers. And if you want to shut this one off, you would go out to the panels that we just had open and shut that off yeah. so that no power would be coming yeah. here first, and then you would turn, you know, manually turn it on exactly. to, to reset that one. Exactly. Correct? It takes time. It's the safest way to do it. If you're brave enough, if you get paid enough, if you're trained, okay? You're training us right now, right? I'm training you on what to not do. <laughs> Don't do what Gabe does. <laughs> yeah, NFP 70 E, I think. Okay, so let's talk about the actual logic. You saw the nameplate. In the nameplate, we'll tell you model number, serial number, spec number. Uh, capacity of this in, in voltage and current, the contactor size. Um, but here's the logic. So, this is called a decision maker MPAC 1200. It's got four LEDs here and two LEDs here. The two upper LEDs are for source available. The two lower LEDs are connected to that source or contactor position. And these are for messages if there's a fault, okay? So, first message, system ready. That's the state we're in now. Next message would be if there's an exercise programmed. It's blank, so nobody's programming exercise. Next one is a quick reference to normal power and generator power. And then your next line is for navigation. You got a down arrow, a view button, a set button, a test button. You also got a USB up here. Do we know what that's for? Plug in your laptop. Programming. Not for battery charge, not for cell phone charging, gentlemen. Oh, really? Come on, that's now. That's a good idea. No, it'll kill your battery. It takes power from there. Okay, so the test, there's one there. Test. What was our super secret password outside? Zero. Okay, so here you get four zeros. You get an up cursor and a right cursor. Up to zero, right. If you go too far, just keep going because it'll eventually get you back to zero. Over, up, over, up, enter. First option in test mode is automatic 30 minutes. If I start that generator, it's gonna turn on, transfer, 30 minutes later, or, or once the 30 minute expires, it's gonna initiate the 15 minute of retransfer time delay. It'll retransfer then, generator goes into cool down, turns off, takes in standby mode. This is about the best feature you can have, because if you get a phone call and you have to rush out, It'll eventually expire itself out all the time delays and you don't have to worry about anything else. Mind you, that 30 minute time delay can be increased or decreased. 
Next option, arrow down, is a loaded test. If I start that, it's gonna turn on, it's gonna transfer. If I get a phone call and walk away, it's gonna keep running until you remember or until you run out of fuel. Next one down is an unloaded test. If I start it now, it's gonna turn the engine on. It will not transfer, but it'll stay running until I tell it to stop. The start command will turn into an end command if we initiate it. The last option is a sync check. That's for an ATS that you guys don't have. Uh, Jim, all of our ATSs here are all this type. There's no special bypass isolation switch. They're all like this, standard transition. Okay, so a sync check is for a different ATS, but it's part of the main menu. Um, if this was a bypass isolation, you'd have a bypass switch here, ATS here, that racks out, harness is still plugged in, I initiate sync check, it'll transfer that ATS without affecting the load, to make sure that everything works before I rack it in. Okay, and then we go arrow down, we're back at the beginning, auto load 30 minutes. Next one is the set. That's the one that gets you into trouble. That's the one where you can change anything you wanna change. Once again, four zeros. First one that comes up is time and date. Next one that comes up is exerciser. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff you don't want to mess with, okay? So if you ever go into that programming mode or the set mode, it's because you want to change time and date. You arrow right, set time, arrow right, military. Well, right now it's 2146, so what's that? 10 p.m.? 2146 is 7 in the evening. Yeah, yeah, this is wrong. So what time is it, guys? 1119. Eleven nineteen. Save. So you got one that works. You got a recording. You got homework to do. You got five more to correct. <laughs> okay. So set time. If you arrow down, set date. Four fourteen oh one. What in the world? I'm gonna find whoever did the commissioning and beat him up. Brad. Brad? Is that what you said, Brad? <laughs> All right. So we are in the tenth month. I believe it's 29th today? Yes. Back, back, main. Okay, gentlemen, you got it recorded. You have no excuse to not correct your other five ATSs. So, test, set, view. The view menu allows you to see everything that's been programmed in this ATS. How it left the factory, what time delays we set in it, inputs, outputs, anything is in the view. And you can go into the view menu without running a risk of changing anything, okay? So, event history, maintenance records, exerciser setup, system setup, source setup. Here, let's go to system setup. Standard transition. Interface disabled, there's no IO mods, 200 app rated. Uh, if you have remote test loading as an input, it'll do loaded tests, that sort of stuff, okay? So that's the view menu. You, you can navigate through the view menu all you want without actually changing anything. The next one is arrow down. So there you get a quick reference to commercial power, face-to-face, -face, lamp test, and back to the main menu. You arrow down, face to neutral. You arrow down, generator face to face. Arrow down, generator face to neutral. And if you had CTs installed on the load side, which nobody ever pays for, so don't be surprised, you would have current here. And then you arrow down, quick reference to time and date, which we corrected. Wait a minute. Didn't I? Oh, yeah, 1121. I thought I saw 2121. And then you arrow down, and then uh, quick reference to his programming. BAC rotation, do we know what that is? Counterclockwise rotation, do we understand what that is? Okay. Back to the beginning, and then main. Okay. If you guys wanna do a, a, a transfer test, I showed you how to do it, but I'm gonna look, go through it again. So we go to test. Four zeros. 
I would choose the auto test. You arrow right. You only want to confirm that everything works, but you don't want to stay on there for 45 minutes because remember, 30 minutes, once that 30 minutes expires, is a retransfer time delay of 15 minutes. So let's say you want to do just 15 minutes, maybe 20. You bring it down to five, you hit OK, you hit start. It's going to turn on, that light turns on, it's going to transfer, you're going to hear it go kathunk. You lose that light, you gain that light. The five minute time delay expires, it then starts the 15 minute time delay for retransfer. Once that expires, it transfers back. Generator goes into cooldown. The generator has a cooldown and a special feature in the cooldown. I wish I would remember that when I was there, but if the engine temperature does not reach past 175, it will shut down immediately. If it's above 175, it'll enable a cooldown of anywhere between 30 seconds up to five minutes, no more than five. So there may be a time where you run it and it'll turn, it'll turn off right away. There may be another time where it'll actually do a full five minute cooldown. If it doesn't hit 175 after the five minutes, it still turns off and stays in standby. Okay. So I keep mentioning a retransfer time delay of 15 minutes. Do we understand what that is? So on a power outage, let's view time delays. Source one, commercial power. It's got a one second time delay to transfer from normal to generator. So it'll send a, a run set to the generator. Once the voltage for that generator is here and the light turns on, it waits one second and then transfers. And then on source two time delays, got a five minute cooldown. Okay, never mind. There's a five minute cooldown here as well. And a 15 minute time delay for a retransfer. So, what you expect to see on a power outage, turn the generator on. If you happen to be here at that same time the power outage happens, okay? Turns it on. Once the voltage hits here, and it recognizes it, it'll turn to a green light or the red light off for generator. It'll wait one second. Why does it wait one second? Because when an engine ramps up from zero RPM to 1800 RPM, sometimes it overshoots a little bit. If it overshoots on the RPM, it'll overshoot on the voltage. Sometimes you'll see 500 volts on the meter, just really quick. So we wait a second for it to stabilize. It'll transfer. Let's see, power outage is three hours. Three hours goes away, <coughs> lights come back on, that light will turn on. But as what is usually the norm on a power outage, it's usually a rolling blackout. Power will sometimes go away in the next five, six, seven minutes. So it waits 15 minutes. It keeps you on generator for 15 minutes. If power on the normal site doesn't fail within those 15 minutes, it'll then go, to, go back to that normal power. So it waits 15 minutes to allow commercial power to stabilize. Some say it's too much. If you guys agree that it's too much, you can reduce it. Give me a call, I'll guide you through it. If you're okay with a 15 minute time delay, let it be. But just expect other lights to be on, but you're still on generator. Just expect that. If other lights turn on that are not on the generator and they're on, give it 20 minutes, maybe 25. If it's still running, then give me a call, <laughs> okay? Just expect an extended time of generator run because it's waiting for stabilization, okay? I don't think we need to do training on every single ATS, guys. If I'm told that they're all the same, then I'm gonna end it here. Um, Jim. The only difference uh, is in building A and B. We have contacts. We use some of your external contacts for the uh, elevator recall. Okay. Or not recall, but elevator status. Okay, let's go over there. Okay. Was it really Brad, Jim? Huh? Was it really Brad when you started? Yeah. I don't think that. Thank you. Set it up. We're good? All right. So this particular ATS, backs up either one elevator or multiple elevators, and certain elevators need a contact 
to, uh, to tell them when they're on generator or, or when they're about to go on generator. It all depends on the elevator logic itself. So we communicate with them. And on the circuit board, there are two outputs, okay? So they tie into these relays. This one here on this side is output two. The one over here with the purple wire is output one, okay? And we'll go and navigate to see what they're programmed as. That's about the only thing different between this one and the other one. I'm pretty sure it's the same current capacity. It's still a four pole contactor. So if we hit the view menu and we go to inputs outputs, arrow right, they're on the main board. There's times where there's another accessory board on the side of the cabinet and that would be auxiliary outputs. So these are only on the main board. So we go to output. Output one is load control. Output two is contactor and preferred source. So output two tells the elevator logic that we are connected to normal source. Preferred, normal, source one, commercial, however you wanna call it. Unfortunately, in our industry, right Jim? There's much, there's much terminology that means the same thing. Source one, normal source, preferred source, uh, commercial, utility, all the same thing. Okay, so what that means, so output two is contactor and preferred source. That means that right now that logic knows that we are connected to normal source. And then output one is load control active. So the load control active is kind of like a pre-signal and a post-signal. So when we're about to transfer and you have both sources available, it'll give like a 30 second signal. The relay, let's say the relay is normally closed and we're about to transfer, 30 seconds before the transfer happens, it opens. 30 seconds expires, the transfer happens. You'll hear this kind of change state. 30 seconds beyond that, it goes back to normally closed. Okay, and that normally happens when it's live source to live source. So in other words, if there's a power outage, there's not gonna be a pre-signal because there's no live source on the normal source. It'll transfer right away. But when the power comes back and we've already expired our 50 minute time delay, before it goes back to normal power, it'll cycle <clears throat> that relay. 30 seconds before the transfer happens, that relay opens. The transfer happens, 30 seconds beyond that transfer, the relay closes. So why do we do that? Why do they request that? To prevent the, the elevator motor from operating when the spike happens. It stops it. The spike happens, 30 seconds beyond that, it goes back to motion. So this, was, this one here's a unique one. It may not look unique, but it is. Okay, any questions on the logic? Impact 1200, navigation buttons. Is this generator gonna turn on once a month or once every two weeks automatically or are you guys gonna do it manually? I'm assuming it's probably gonna be automatic. If, if neither of your ATSs have, oh, here it is. <laughs> so here is your exercise cycle programmed on this logic rather than all five or six or however many they are. So on all the other ATSs, you're gonna have a blank second line. Here, you've got actually something. NL stands for no load. Exercise 1001. Oh, come on now, that hasn't been programmed. We're past 1001 at 12. <laughs> If you want more detail, you go to the view menu. You go down to exerciser setup. So exerciser one enabled for 30 minutes starting 10-1 at 12. And it's day of the month with no load. But here we can't, we, we just see that. Let's go to the set menu. Go down to Exerciser. There's 21 events total that you can program. Why 21? I don't know. 
It's just an odd number, right? 21. Somebody was in Vegas at the time when they came up with this idea. So exerciser one, enabled, no load. Day of the month, repeat rate one. Duration, 30 minutes. Hours and minutes, okay? Start date, 10 one at 12. And then you save it. I haven't changed anything. I don't have to save it. But let's just save it. So the fact that it thinks that we're not past that date makes me wonder what the time and date is. Ah, 422.01. This will not exercise for another 18 years. Okay, who wants to do the programming? I need a second. I mean, a volunteer. <laughs> You're first in line, come on. <laughs> so you're going to hit set. set. Four zeros. Oh, wrong way. So if I go past that. Yeah. Okay. Time and date. Lucky you. Arrow right. Time. It thinks it's 4 a.m. Six or seven now. A minute off doesn't doesn't hurt. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it one minute off. So, so now you hit save. Entry accepted. Unless you see entry accepted, yeah. you haven't saved it. You must see entry accepted. Arrow one more time. Oops. <clears throat> Getting trigger happy, huh? Yep. I do it all the time. Save. Now, if I want to view that, well, I guess. Well, it's you just see how the, it's no longer there on the second row. Yeah. The, you see how it went away because yeah, it's conflicting. Date. Right. So let's go to set. Four zeros is your password. Okay. And roll down to exerciser. Oops, too far. No, go go up, go up. There's like thirty you gotta okay. go through. It's easier to go up. Enabled, hit next, unloaded next, day of the month next, repeat rate one, yes, 30 minutes. Start day. So, right there, well, well, let me ask you this are you guys gonna let it exercise automatically or will you do it manually? I don't know, we'll let our boss decide that. We, okay. we don't really know yet, but okay. I'm assuming we're gonna have it exercise automatically, is probably what we're gonna do, you know. I'll tell you what, to avoid any, any runs between now and when you get a national, why don't we put it to exercise at 1201.19? That way it gives you, gives you a couple of weeks to get answers. We, don't even, we, we, won't even, we won't even be in the buildings by then, I don't think. I don't think they're turned over to us till... Nice. Okay, okay, we'll go back, we'll go back. Let's just finish going through this so you, 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 go, you go through it. <laughs> You're like that. February would work. Next Tuesday, it's all yours. Nine eleven five. Oops. Okay, so hit next. Noon. Sure. Save. So now, if you if you if you back out of it, you'll see it on the second line. So now it'll so show. So there it is. Yeah. yeah. But let's yeah. disable it for now until you get answers. So once again, set, set. four zeros. Exerciser, number one, you're good. Arrow over, right there. Arrow up, disable. Yeah, next. Now you have to go through the whole thing. Yeah, until it goes to save. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you know how to go through the whole exerciser setup, and right now it's not enabled, so. So from this main screen though, I can get the date. Yeah, If I come down, so the date right and time is correct right there, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Okay. All right, let's talk about the enunciator, that irritating beeping sound that we've been hearing for the last 15 minutes. So this is your generator <clears throat> remote enunciator. We call it the remote serial enunciator three, RSA three. Okay. Here, like this, perfect. All right, so we have a flashing system ready. Do we remember what that is? How you feel? If this was in somebody's office, they'd be killing us by now, right? Yeah. All right, so here's a list of faults. Unfortunately, high fuel is not on there. It's not part of NFPA 110. NFPA 110 says low fuel. So you're not gonna get leak. You're not gonna get high fuel. You're not gonna get critical high fuel. But because there is a fault, you get flashing system ready. Okay, so in a way, it is telling you that you have a fault, but unfortunately, it's not a designated fault. Okay, first one, overcrank. Do we recall what would cause overcrank? Start. So overcrank means it tried to start three times. It cranked three times. Crank for 15 seconds, pause for 15 seconds. At the end of the last cycle, if it, doesn't, if it did not see a certain RPM range or a threshold, It'll go into shutdown mode for overcrank. High engine temperature. If a generator is running and you got an amber high engine temp, that means it's still running and it's a warning that you're approaching a shutdown. If it's red, that means a generator has shut down on high engine temperature. There, there, there are two numbers, two key numbers. Like, I think it's like 224, 226 is a warning. And like 232, something like that is a shutdown. Next one is low oil pressure, same story. Amber, if the generator is running and it comes in as a warning. Red, if it actually shut, shut down because it's a lower oil pressure. Next one, overspeed. That's the one that's controlled by the ECU. Uh, it keeps it solidly at 60 Hertz. So you probably will never see overspeed with this generator. Emergency stop. That means somebody has hit either one of those two buttons, the one that's the local one at the controller or the one that's outside on the enclosure. Low fuel level. Do we panic when we see low fuel level? No. Nah, you're at 50%. You're at 50%. Yeah. 50% of seven, what did I say the tank was? 770 what? 74. So 50% means you got 350 plus still. You're good. <laughs> Just call it a fuel drop. Low coolant level slash auxiliary. There's a sensor on top of the radiator tank right next to the upper radiator hose. If your coolant level drops below that, low coolant level shut down. Remember, it's a shutdown latching fault. Slash auxiliary. The auxiliary means that it's alternator related. Zero volts coming out of the alternator. High volts or low volts. Not a solid 480. Low coolant temperature. That means the block heater is off, either because it's bad or somebody turned the breaker off or somebody turned the breaker that feeds that sub panel off. One of the three. Or a bad thermostat in the block heater body. Low cranking voltage comes in only when it's cranking and only when you drop to 14 volts DC for 10 seconds or more. Chances are you'll replace those batteries before you ever see that. Remember, three three years. Hopefully. Three years, hopefully. I know, they, they always say, oh no, no, that guy's wrong. Okay, we'll see about that. Battery voltage, high-low. That comes in at any time, whether the engine is running or not. That means your voltage is above, do we recall what the voltage was for high? Above 32? Below 24 for low voltage. Just go to a system on the generator and it'll tell you all these things. Battery charger fail. What does that mean? That means somebody unplugged the charger or the breaker to the charger receptacle is off or the breaker to that sub panel is off. Common fault. Uh, depending on the unit, you probably will never see common fault or common fault will come in with any fault. 
attached to that fault. The fact that we have high fuel and we don't have common fault tells me that you'll never see common fault. <laughs> okay, top right, EPS applying load. That means the generator is powering something, whether it's powering the building or the load bank. Remember, you got a load bank, so you don't have to be under a power outage condition to see EPS applying load. You just apply load with the load bank. Did I drop something? You just apply load with the load bank and you'll get EPS applying load. The logic doesn't care. As long as it's powering something, it'll give you EPS applying load. Not an auto, it's pretty straightforward. You're not an auto. The key switch is in the center position, which is not an auto. And, or actually there it says off reset. So you got run, off reset, and auto. So if you're either in off reset or run, both of those are manual conditions. You're not an auto, so you'll get non-auto here. System ready, comes in with any fault, whether it's a good fault or a bad fault. Right now we have a good fault, we have high fuel condition. Generator running will come in anytime that engine is running, whether it's manual, whether it's a power outage, whether it's a key switch, whether it's through the logic here, generator running. And the last one, communication status. You want that to always be green. If you lose communication status, that means the data cable between this guy and the generator has been damaged or somebody went to the generator programming mode and changed communication settings and it's no longer communicating, one or the other. Ideally, if we had no faults, you would have a green comm status and a green system ready solid, not flashing, okay? These are for other user inputs. If you guys tell me, hey Gabe, I don't see tank leak here, but I want tank leak, I can assign that as a tank leak. You gotta come up with a printer though. <laughs> you gotta come up with a P-touch. If you wanna do generator door intrusion, you, you wanna put sensors on there and, and program that controller and program this, it's possible. These are all for you guys to use, user inputs. Marty. Okay, and then what last but not the least, that blue button is for lamp test. And what else? Silence. What Barney should be doing, silence. Okay, the fact that it's flashing tells me that somebody has already pushed it before and that's why it's silent. If I didn't silence it, it wouldn't be flashing. And last but not least, USB. For me only, for my for my programming, for assigning inputs that you guys would like in the future. Any questions, gentlemen? Is that silence button like after 24 hours start ringing again? Or is is any change of status on the controller? If I go over there and e stop it and then and then clear it, that guy turns on again. But, but, yeah, but I'm 24 hours. If nothing's changed between now and 24 hours, it stays silent. Like on a fire panel, sometimes if you silence it and you don't correct the issue, 24 hours from now it starts ringing again. No, it doesn't do that. Not like that. No. So if you silence that, so if that one's going off out there and you silence that one, will you have to come in and silence this one as well? So mm -hmm. we have, we would have to. So say something, some status so changes, this one, and then it's is this bringing the only up a fuel. Yeah, yeah. Bring, it's bringing Should up a know. fuel thing, and then so we would have Should to reset both of them. Yeah, or silence both. I don't see a desk and a chair in here. No, no one's going to be here. It ain't going to bug nobody. That concerning it, just, you know, it's something that... Mm -hmm. so I'm sure... Building A, do we have to go south? Yes. No, this, I think this is the only one, right? Sure. There's no the there's one. no panel like this in A. This is the only other... This is the only panel like this. There's not one in D, there's not one in A, there's only this one. Any other questions? What's the most important menu to look at? Here's, here's the quiz, guys. What's the most important menu to look at on the generator? Extra has gas. Battery. Menu. Menu. Service menu. The operations menu. Menu four. That's where you get your run hours. That's how you keep those little trolls with the big stick off your back. <laughs> AQMD. They're not, they're not fun to play with. They can make your life a living hell. Okay, guys? Keep your permits updated. And keep that hour that uh, that log updated. How many hours do they specify? For Every site's different. Typically, generic is 200 hours per year. Out of the 200 hours, 20 is for testing and maintenance. 
Exerciser? Part of testing. Yeah. So, so for 30 minutes at the end of the year, if you have no power outages in between and, and no other maintenance in between, but you need to have maintenance, maintenance oil change with a test yeah. run. Yeah. Oil change. If you guys, if you guys hire someone to come out and, and, and do your maintenance on your generators, make sure that when they do their run, that they activate that load bank. You want to have load on there as much as possible, as frequent as possible to keep those PM filters clean. Well, that's one that exercises it. It's exercising it, but it's calling unloaded. So mm -hmm. when you exercise it, like from these, do you recommend loaded or unloaded? I, as a mechanic and a representative of the factory, loaded. Right. Factory recommendations since 1976 has been once a week, 20 minutes with load. That is not a good schedule for us to keep in California yeah. because we have a QMD. So you can't go by the factory recommendations. So if you're gonna go once a month for 30 minutes, make sure that those 30 minutes are with load. Either disable that and, and dedicate someone out there to, you have to run it. Yeah. You cannot just leave it sitting there because eventually the fuel on the lines will drip into the tank. You'll lose prime. When a power outage happens, it will crank and, crank and crank and crank and crank and crank and fail to start. What kind of fuel pressure system is like does it weed air or anything like that if, if the fuel were to drain out and it has to it has air. check valves to prevent that okay. but check valves are mechanical yeah. they are they are spring loaded they have a seal seals wear out springs wear out you, you, you're not going to experience any issues anytime soon it's when a unit becomes right around 15 years old yeah. where you start experiencing all these all these random issues you know, fail to start, even though there's no problems with it, as far as the fuel system is sealed and everything else, replace a check valve, you know, polish your fuel, replace batteries, kind of hope you do it every three years. Yeah. yeah, so we should, it sounds like for this specific generator, we should be running it loaded anytime we test it, period. Yes. Especially for the- Yes, whether, whether you transfer your ATSs, whether you come here and do your transfer right, you and then go out there and then add more load with the load bank so that you hit 700 degrees, or let's hope that load bank's big enough to make you to make it hit 700 degrees. Yeah. Gentlemen, is it lunchtime yet? Okay. Let's, let's, let's call my salesperson. <laughs> Tell him to come down here. He owes you guys donuts, some croissants. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, that's it. You got my business cards. Any questions? Phone call, follow up with a text. I will reply. Even if it's three in the morning and I'm asleep, call me several times. I'm a heavy sleeper. Okay. How, how long have you worked for them? I have been in the industry for eight, 19 years. I've been with Bay City off and on for about six, seven years, but I've stayed with Culver my whole career. Change phone numbers ever? 